Okay, hello and welcome to the CSA Email Summit Digital this year. Um, to the webinar, um, how to build a bridge, a senders and receivers. Um, ah, other way around, sorry. Uh, where is it gone? Um, with uh, oh, I'm so sorry. Um, we uh, to to the CSA email summer digital webinar. Um, my name is Sebastian. I'm uh, part of the Certified Senders Alliance, and I'm the moderator for this session today. Um, I would like to introduce the three speakers to you uh, for that webinar. Before we do that, I would love to just give you a quick overview about the housekeeping rules. You will be muted the whole uh, webinar. Questions will be answered in the Q&A session at the very end. So you have the chance to ask your questions. Please raise them in the meantime during the question section or the chat, the chat section of the webinar tool. You may find them on the right hand side um, of your screen. Um, and um, I will pick them up and um, the three presenter will answer those questions um, afterwards. And if I've already talked about the three presenters, here we go. Um, welcome, Clea. Um, she has been working with Return Pass and Spark Post in the past, and now she's director um, of uh, Deliverability Consulting with Oracle, um, as well as Heather. 10 years experience working for um, Oracle and as well um, participant and active in the MOOC. And last but not least, it's Marcel. Um, he's driving business development and deliverability um, um, topics at Verizon. And before that, he was working for AOL. And now I'm handing over to the three presenters. for the presentation. The stage is yours. Hey guys, I hope you can see that. Just a quick uh, thumbs up from you, Sebastian, if you can see it. Yes, looks good. I can, it looks good. Perfect. Hey everybody, uh, good morning from uh, where I'm at uh, in California right now. Um, so Sebastian already introduced us, so we can kind of skip through that. Uh, we all three like to talk a lot, and um, I think we can reserve the time for some Q&A at the end. So uh, where are we? And um, the stupid window is in the way here. So I'm not seeing anything. So <laughs> where are we? So we should have been in we should have been in uh, Cologne for the session earlier this year, and clearly we're not. Uh, when you know <laughs> when you're looking left and right, you're not in Cologne. Uh, you're probably at your home office or maybe at the office somewhere in Europe. Um, and we're literally all over the place um, and so on so many levels. Um, but why are we where we are now? Right uh, right now. So a little bit of background of myself. Um, I grew up in East Germany and I literally would not be here today if not some uh, brave souls, I would say, would have teared down that wall over there. I grew up on the other side. And um, because of that, I learned to look at both sides, really. Um, it, uh, you know, everything I learned, everything I was told, uh, not everything, but most of it, uh, turned out not to be true. And to me, this was always, <clears throat> I realized you need to ask questions. You need to put yourself in uh, the shoes of the other side. It, you need to try to understand the other perspective and ask some questions. So that's why the, the idea of this talk first was about looking at how senders and receivers look at the world of email marketing, uh, but also trying to see if we can build bridges between senders and receivers. And then obviously COVID hit and everything changed. It was not really only about building bridges between senders and receivers. It was in some 
way really about building bridges between between people uh, because we're all affected and email became uh, so much more important to stay connected um, and of course it was about uh, <clears throat> building bridges between businesses large and small uh, connecting brands and consumers small businesses uh, I mean, like I said, people, and it has been a roller coaster really since. Um, I used that picture last year at the CSA conference because it, you know the industry changed a lot. But now, uh, who could predict that? Who could have predicted that, right? Who could have thought that we'd be in that situa situation? So, <clears throat> email or consumer email is still about uh, you know connecting brands to consumers, as I said before, 96% of all the email we actually receive is from uh, companies talking or staying in contact with their customers. And that's now even more true in the times we are living. So let's look at some of these uh, stats pretty quickly before we look at how senders and then how we on our side, receivers, uh, perceive the world of email marketing. Heather? Awesome. Thank you, Marcel, for teeing us up there. And um, thank you for being the type of person that looks at the big picture and for inviting us to collaborate. And I want to thank the CSA as well um, for opening up this conversation and allowing Clea and I to participate. Thank you. It's an honor. So um, as Marcel was just pointing out, when you think about that staggering statistic he just had on the screen about consumer email being 96% of it non-conversational. So when you think of how you use email, Another statistic that Marcel shared with us is that 25% of users use email only and exclusively for shopping. So what this says is email is being used to buy things um, and we continue to buy online because of email. Um, so that's kind of an interesting way to think about where we're moving and how we're innovating around email. Um, this slide starts to share a lot about why we need to build bridges. And when you think about the U.S. Internet users and how many of them participate in these various activities to the right, while there are a lot of channels and a lot of ways people engage digitally, um, email is still the broadest in scope as far as 90% of users um, that use the internet do use email. So it's an age old conversation, right? Is email dead? Um, and this chart to the right indicates that maybe it's not, right? And Clea will share something with you as well. I also wanna point out that the CSA is an example of a leading global organization that establishes a higher standard for all of us, frankly. And they lead the charge to protect the email ecosystem. And I think in order for all of us to be understanding how important it is, email has got to stay viable and effective to thrive. And so as a result, we both have the responsibility as senders and as receivers to protect it and to innovate around it because email is still the backbone of the digital economy. I'm going to share one more thing that Clea is going to talk about here about email in general. Clea? Thanks, Heather. Not only is email a leading channel and digital, as you just heard, but email adoption is expected to continue growing over the next several years. With reliance on email as an integral part of online life, there comes greater security risks, as spammers and fishers become more sophisticated, creating new challenges for brands and receiving systems. And at the same time, consumers are expecting a more rich and integrated experience. This year has really thrown some new challenges our way with COVID creating more reliance on digital. Brands are scrambling to make up lost, make up lost revenue. They're relying more heavily on email. Um, yet there's still a lot of uncertainty around consumer behavior and what they'll tolerate. So it's a delicate balance that senders are trying to strike. This holiday season will likely be make or break for a lot of businesses um, with consumers expecting to do most of their shopping online. We expect marketers to start their holiday campaigns as early as October in line with Amazon Prime Day. It feels like the appropriate cliche in this environment is that the only thing that is constant is that nothing is constant. Heather. Thank you. Um, so as Clea just pointed out, this chart starts to demonstrate how different things look. So you can see when COVID hit there where that red arrow points down, um, open rate and click-through rate declined, but then you see this incredible increase in slope and trend. And we saw this with our clients as well. So crazy stuff in the trends um, and it continues to change. We don't know what's coming. And so, you know, stuff is continuing to evolve. Yeah, so 
Uh, like we said, a lot changed since the beginning of the year, and who knows, uh, as Heather is uh, what we're saying right now. So the question is, do we actually deliver on the promise uh, on the assumptions we make on both sides? Um, and we make a lot of assumptions, I think, um, especially we realized that when we prepared for this conversation. So let's take a look at both of these sides, and we start with the senders first. Awesome. Thank you, Marcel. So I recognize that we hardly represent all of senders, but we um, hopefully as an industry and my colleagues will agree that we feel like ISPs have come to the table. Um, we're shaking hands more often than we ever have before. We're talking, we're sharing perspectives on a human level. Um, we're getting to know each other. We recognize that we need to understand each other's businesses to innovate and to move forward. So not a lot has changed with email in a really long time if you start to think about it. But I think because of this need for change and this dire pressure to move forward, as Clea pointed out, with digital becoming everything, that we really need to understand each other's businesses. And I think you'll notice here today, especially, that ISPs are talking and thinking like marketers more than ever before. And because of this, we have some really exciting developments as a result. So one thing I want to talk about is sort of our perspective as senders. We've had some wins and accomplishments for sure, and we've had some challenges. So I'm just going to walk you through a summary of those, and then Clea and I will dive into those a little bit deeper as we go. But senders have had more access to valuable data than we ever have before. So we have access to first and third party data that we can use to piecemeal together a better picture of what we're doing. We also have evolved in our smarter data models. We're more sophisticated and we're highly effective in creating deliverability stability with those models. Um, there's been a broad spectrum of knowledge with email deliverability, as you know, but most senders have experienced a dire deliverability issue that has grabbed the attention of leadership and required some form of action. And just by virtue of that happening to a lot of senders, the overall knowledge of deliverability in general has raised as, a, as an industry. So while senders are educated on the reality of managing better reputation, we still find that lots of leadership doesn't understand, so there's always that need to keep educating. We have all kinds of what we're going to call today shiny new toys. So these are things to choose from that the ISPs have developed, various programs, technologies, some awesome opportunities. The challenges for us is limited resources and time to choose which which of these shiny new toys are worth the effort. And there's been a lot of layoffs, as Cleo was pointing out with COVID, there's furloughs, there's a lot of very thin, small teams trying to keep the lights on. So making these choices is a bigger deal than you would imagine or, or guess. We also have this issue of declining engagement rates even prior to COVID. So we had a very steady decline in email engagement rates across the board, across verticals that we're grappling with as an industry. Um, ISPs are rolling out unsubscribe prompts, which I'll show you some visual examples of. There's a lot of questions around email engagement as we collaborate more and talk with the ISPs. The way ISPs measure engagement, the way we measure engagement can look very different from a results perspective. We're trying to understand why. And then there's a constantly changing landscape. For example, AMP for email is no longer supported by Microsoft, although we're very excited about this innovation. How much should we invest in it? So with that, I'll hand it over to Clea. Thanks, Heather. So as Heather just mentioned, we have these shiny new toys available, which is this assortment of standards and features developed by receivers. BIMI, AMP, schema, annotations, the list goes on. Some are pay to play, some are free. Um, but the challenge for us, again, is measuring the ROI, helping our customers to identify that net value in terms of the cost to implement and then the impact to their bottom line. Without the measurable benefit, it's really hard for us to make the case that they should adopt these standards. And there's also the possibility that receivers could sunset the, their support for these features at some point. We just heard, of course, Microsoft Outlook dropped their um, AMP support. So is it really worth the effort to, to implement? Another challenge is that for the most part, these solutions are really piecemeal. Um, so we don't have widespread support across all ISPs. It's really a handful of ISPs here and there. So just to show an example of what I was describing earlier, Yahoo Mail rolled out the subscription view on mobile a year ago. So a year ago from now, September 2019. Then they rolled out desktop June 2020. And frankly, the subscription view is a nice 
feature in the sense that it sets it up as a separate view. So each brand that's sending you email is listed and then their respective from addresses and then it lists the weekly frequency, which is really interesting if you haven't seen this yet. Um, but then there is the huge dreaded unsubscribe button to the marketer anyway, it's dreaded. It is a convenience to the consumer and we cannot deny that we need to provide easy, good ways for consumers to get off an email list if they simply don't want to get email from them anymore. But using this list unsubscribe functionality and tying it back in, giving them yet another option or way to unsubscribe is becoming a challenge for marketers. This next slide shows the treatment of how Gmail handles this. So while I was in the primary tab of my Gmail account lately, um, this huge prompt comes up from Banana Republic. Um, you haven't opened emails from the sender in the last month, unsubscribe or no thanks. So it's a pretty brazen, big use of real estate to remind me or ask me if I wanna unsubscribe. Ironically, Banana Republic's one of my favorite brands. So I'm gonna pass it over to Clea to talk about what does this look like actually in the metrics? Thanks, Heather. Yeah, we've seen notable upticks in the unsubscribe rates for Gmail and Verizon Media following the rollout of Yahoo Subscriptions View, as you just saw, and the increase in frequency of those unsubscribe prompts from Gmail. Unsub rates for all ISPs are also significantly higher year over year, as you can see. And with, when COVID, shut, COVID shutdowns actually initially hit uh, around March, we see this brief dip in unsubscribe rates across the board, but all domains are trending higher since then. Digital is getting more attention, of course, as we've been talking about. So that's potentially contributing to this increase as well. More people are in their email, looking at their inboxes, potentially cleaning them out via unsubscribe. Um, so that's something to consider. At the same time, um, with receivers making it easier to unsubscribe, relevancy and personalization have become more important than ever. The challenge is that we need data to build that customer story. With the development of legislation like GDPR and CCPA and increased sensitivity on the receiver side, access to this data that we need is becoming increasingly restricted. We've seen email panel data disappear due to privacy concerns. There have been limitations on cookie tracking, obviously, which affect our ability to map site activity back to a customer profile. Of course, we understand that the protection of data privacy, personal privacy is important, but how do we reach that right balance in order to make data sharing safe and beneficial for everybody? I'll pass it to Heather. Thanks, Clea. So we want to talk through this whole theme that we've been describing about looking at the right metrics. So traditionally, ESPs have looked at open pixels. And frankly, this has been, it works well, it's reliable. So essentially brands are able to effectively diagnose if there's a deliverability issue or even a business conversion issue based on that open pixel. Um, there have been some questions raised about the difference between ESPs, engagement rates, and ISPs. So when ISPs and senders talk, we see that the open pixels look a lot different. So regardless of why, at the end of the day, the sender's unique open rates by ISP by day is really hugely powerful. So if you're fortunate enough to have access to this, typically when open rates are less than two to 3% at any given ISP, that means there's probably some sustained widespread junk foldering going on. And that's time for us to take action looking at that sender's reputation. What are we doing with our activity targeting and what is causing this junk foldering issue? Why do we have a reputation issue at that ISP? This measurement pixel allows us to diagnose that pretty quickly. So our advice that Clea will talk about is we should really look at all the metrics and make sure that we're thinking of things directionally and look concentrate on trends up or down and why it's moving up and down. Additionally, we may not always have access to the simple open pixel because as Marcel's pointing out, and he'll, you'll see later in one of his slides, like Echo, Amazon's Echo Dot or Google's Nest, there's a lot of devices that are consuming email that don't even have pixels available. So we need to evolve as an industry. And Marcel is trying to lead the charge in talking about this, and he has some exciting things to share. I'm going to give some uh, talking points to Clea that are critical here on this point as well. Clea? Yeah, Heather just alluded to potential gaps in the data that senders have. It can also be a challenge for senders to get access to data by ISP or log data. So they may be relying on limited metrics like sender score or seed placement data to gauge the success of their programs. And also when measuring email ROI, there are other important metrics to consider other than just open rates, click-through rates. Consider things like lifetime customer value, revenue per email and site visits. These allow us to look further down the funnel and provide a better picture 
of program performance. Thank you, Clea and Heather. Uh, certainly some insightful uh, nuggets there, um, especially around the, the shiny toys, I would say. And uh, let's put a pin in that and come back to that. Um, so what is the perspective from our side, from the receiving end? And like I said, I uh, personally am responsible for deliverability and some of the next generation features we're actually building for senders within our Yahoo Mail and AOL Mail consumer products. So as that, we really have one mission and that, that mission is really to ensure that our users receive all the emails they want and all the crap they do not want, we want to keep out, right? And that's obviously a challenge because you know, 90% of all the email which is actually hitting our front gate is crap. Like 90%, nine zero, is something people do not want. And we actually block right on the MPA or IP level, right? So as you can see to us, um, a lot of you good guys actually look like, you know, these bad guys or you're competing with the bad guys. And the bad guys, they look a little bit like the good guys. And um, obviously we want to help our users to discover what is really important to them and you know what isn't and that's not easy especially considering the growing email volume especially now with COVID-19 everybody's trying to compete with the uh, user's attention and everybody's just cramming more and more into a user's email mailbox and you know with the growing email volume the email fatigue is obviously growing as well and at the same uh, same time, a lot of senders are still treating email like print, right? They think, oh, I just, you know, print this uh, flyer a million times and then I just pay somebody to get it, you know, over the wall into the user's mailbox and all is good. Uh, and they don't, they're not really incentivized, you know, some of these senders, I would say, are not really incentivized to actually invest more money. So it might actually, some of these officers, who knows, uh, might look like uh, this guy right there. And so with that growing amount of email and uh, with our desire to help our users, obviously uh, we have a lot of data and we also look at, at a lot of data and we deal with a lot of data. Uh, we use it to uh, identify malicious behavior. Uh, we use it to fight spam. We use it to protect our users, um, but we also use it to actually address questions senders might have when they come to us and ask us like, you know, why are my click rates down? Why are my open rates down? Um, uh, things to that nature. And the problem here really is that, you know, when we deal with data, we have to keep privacy in mind and privacy now is even more important than before. Um, you know, certainly, uh, if I go through the details of this slide here, it's just to illustrate that it's certainly a jungle out there, right? So we have all these countries coming up with different laws and different ideas on how to protect the user and they don't always align but uh, we certainly welcome the challenge because we think on our side it makes perfect sense we need to protect our users our users expect us that we keep them safe and secure that we protect their data uh, from unauthorized access and they would not expect that senders actually know when they read an email where they read an email how often they read an email uh, when you actually ask these users and you tell them, you know, did you know that your favorite brand is actually tracking you? Most of them, uh, they would say, get the F out of here. Um, that's not what um, I want out of my email service. So they rightfully expect us to keep them safe and secure. Um, at the same time, obviously, you know, you on the sending side, uh, Heather and Clea, you, you look at, you look at, look at KPIs, you need to share data with your customers as well, as you rightfully said, uh, you need them to have some insight into um, email campaigns and their performance. But I think we have been a little bit naive in the past where we, you know, we just looked at data, we shared data because we, you know, quite frankly, we could, and we just took things for granted. And maybe we shouldn't do that anymore, right? We need to take a close look and a hard look at uh, some of the be best or some of the pra practices in the past, things like panel data and maybe even pixel tracking, you know, they might tell you one side of the story, it might not be the complete picture, uh, but they also tell you all kinds of other things. Uh, our users would not expect us to share with senders. So we're taking, you know, obviously panel data is not allowed anymore for Verizon Media. It is also not allowed for 
uh, Gmail in some cases. And we're also taking a hard look at tracking pixels, right? Um, what we do there. Um, and we believe senders can maybe measure things, or I would challenge senders to measure things maybe in a different way. We look at the type of business and what matters to the business, right? right? Maybe it's clicks, maybe it's conversions, maybe you can uh, leverage other sources uh, and see what the result of your email campaign actually is versus relying heavily on open pixels or open rates. Um, and at the same time, obviously, we're building a, a service, we're building apps for our consumers, right? We uh, want to be the best consumer email application or service out there uh, for, frankly, our mutual customers. Remember that 96% of the email in our users' mailboxes is commercial. It is brands talking to our customers. So let's look at some of these shiny toys, um, as Heather and Clear were, uh, were called them. Uh, one certainly is AMP. Everybody's talking about it now, you know, especially since Microsoft. Uh, I would say wrongfully uh, thought they should not support anymore. I think they will come around at the end of the day. Um, AMP is really, AMP for email is a subset of AMP has been out there and as such, it is already a standard. Uh, a lot of portal developers, a lot of developers should know how to actually build AMP content and that's the beauty, right? You can, in some cases you can take AMP, put it into an email, into an email and you can create this rich, uh, engaging dynamic experience for our mutual customers really and allow them to close this transaction right there with an email. You know, they don't have to go elsewhere. Um, they can browse a catalog of things and can buy it right then and there. It removes friction, increases customer experience. Um, then there are things like, uh, I call them schema because it's based on uh, the standard schema.org. You can actually go there and look it up. Um, it is a standard built by Microsoft, Yahoo, Gmail, and others. Uh, Google calls it annotations or uh, email markup. Microsoft, they call it actionable messages. But what it really allows us to do is we can extract relevant information from within uh, those emails. So all users can find the most relevant information um, from within an email and be able to actually interact with it and act on it. And we can display that not just within an email, obviously, but we can do this elsewhere as well. Uh, Google does it, you have, you've seen it in the promotion tabs. And um, we, you know, doing this, allowing machines to understand the content and the context of an email really allows us to build beautiful experiences for our users, right? Something which doesn't look like an email app anymore, something which deals with the flood, uh, the ever-growing flood of emails, and we can show them what really is important to them, when they need it, where they need it, and really help them to cut through all the noise and engage with uh, relevant content from their favorite brands. But even above and beyond that, right? When you think about it, uh, we might consume emails in other contexts um, on other devices, which do not have an HTML screen, uh, which are not able to you know, display that flyer you replicated 100 million times. So putting schema in there to allow you know uh, you, the email apps to understand what's in there structured data is really really helpful and you can imagine you know if, if you're in a car or something like that it's uh, important there as well the other shiny object or tool is bimi bimi stands for brand indicator for message identification that's a mouthful really um, and what it really is and if you want to learn more you can go to bimigroup.org uh, what it really is and, and why we, Veres Media, really participate in it, it's really simple, right? It just allows a brand to publish and control uh, their brand logo, the brand logo, which is already in some cases being used and displayed next to a message you're actually sending or the brand is sending to our mutual customers, right? In our case, we show it next to the message list uh, within our Yahoo Mail and AOL Mail apps or when you're actually opening the email, you know, you have the little avatar there. And we just ask our users what they prefer, right? So we ask them, you know, if you see these three uh, experiences, we ask them, you know, do you want a message list without any logos? Do you want one where you have some avatars, maybe from your friends, but that's kind of it? Or do you prefer one where you see the brands? And since over 50% of users, not just our users, but in general, make a decision whether to open or delete an email based on visual cues or information they can see right in the message list, the logo plays an important part. So to us, it was a no-brainer. And then when we looked at the three experiences, we saw that you know, 
compared to the experience with no logo and the one with the brand logo, we saw an increase in engagement by 10%. Um, and so far we launched uh, BIMI support or the, the pilot at least in March, 2018. Uh, we're now out of the pilot. Google just announced their version of the pilot. They have some additional requirements and you can learn more at bimicroup.org. But we have uh, roughly a thousand brands um, which have published a BIMI logo and which we are showing within uh, our email app. So to me, this is a success. Uh, at the same time, we also saw a, an increase in DMARC adoption, correlation, causalis, caus, I, no, I'm not able to pronounce the word, Cause Carousalisay, Carlos, uh, whatever. <laughs> the reason for it, whether DMARC was to, or BIMI was the reason for DMARC to go down or not, who knows? I take it. So, how do all these puzzle pieces, all these shiny toys fit together? Um, why are we doing this? Like I said, we do it to increase the customer experience. Um, and they're really just puzzle pieces for a bigger picture, right? So, <clears throat> when you look at the message list and you open this message list right there. Uh, or you open an email in the message list rather right there. Uh, you know, you have the your email view. When you open the content, you have a very rich experience. You can browse things in there. Uh, you can order things, you can save things, you can check out right within the email. And obviously in the message list, the logo is driven by Bimi. Uh, the uh, extraction or the important information at the top of the email or at the top of the inbox is driven by schema annotations, whatever you want to call them. Uh, that rich information is driven by AMP. And then I said before, like we don't like panel data, pixel tracking, uh, but we realized the need to help senders. So we created a, a more privacy conscious way of actually sharing data. Uh, so open rates and understanding how many people actually look at your email is driven by true engagement data. Um, so this is really our side of the, or our perspective. Uh, this is, you know, our puzzle pieces, our parts of the bridge. Uh, I still think the industry is broken in a way. Um, so how do we build that bridge, right? How can we, you know, tear down these walls I was talking about before, because I think there, you know, we, we, there were walls that still are in some cases between senders and receivers. Um, and how can we, work together. And I think the good news here is really, we have many of those puzzle pieces already. Uh, senders and receivers, in my opinion, just need to be on one team and then work on putting them together. And we need to find a way to actually do this. So let's look at some of the uh, topics and um, things we talked about. Shiny objects is, is one of them, right? Um, so as I said, I believe in building these features because they help our users, right? They create a better customer experience. And by doing this, I believe they also help the brands and the centers to increase the ROI at the end of the day. But then uh, <clears throat> Clea and also Hepa was saying, it is a challenge because they don't necessarily understand like why are we doing this and how to adapt to that. Um, and the ROI is not very readily apparent. Um, so so Clea, mm -hmm. what, is your, what is your opinion? Yeah. How, what can we do to you know bridge that gap, build that bridge there? Yeah, I think you really just you really just spoke to it in that puzzle pieces side. It's really coming together and collaborating more. I mean, there's also this gap on the sender side where you know we we're building alternatives to these tools like kinetic design as an example of an alternative for A and P, which impacts all ISPs. And so if we're really thinking about the same things, let's get together at the same table and talk through you know, how we can build these features from the get-go together. Yeah, and, and you just touched on something there, like kinetic design. So wh while it might sound to be the same, and also I think Salesforce, they also have this, uh, uh, you know, the former rebel guys, they're obviously big in dynamic emails, um, forms and things like that. I believe AMP can actually do more than what you can do with all these kind of workarounds there. So this is clearly an indication that we, I think, yes, we need to talk a little bit more. And I believe in the case of AMP, maybe, you know, um, we, we haven't really been at the same table. So to me, this means, you know, get the centers on the table, get the brands at, at the same table and actually talk through some of these things, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, if we have all the information, then we can sell it more easily to our, to our customers. Yeah, and then, 
there, Heather uh, talked about that, and, and we talked about this in the past. So this is something which was near and dear to our hearts, and obviously Heather had the, had the, you know, some more thoughts around that, and it was the subscription opportunity because. I mean, obviously we build it because we wanted to help our users to get rid of all the stuff which is sitting in their inbox. Uh, they don't need it anymore. Uh, hardly anybody deletes email. So it's just sitting there. It's just contributing to, to the email fatigue. At the same time, obviously, we're also a little, little selfish, right? Because we have to store it. If no, nobody's deleting this stuff. You know, we keep, e you know, all these emails are just sitting there um, in their, their uh, you know, digital waste uh, at the end of the day. So that's why we built it. We wanted to help our users get rid of the stuff they do not want anymore. At the same time, we also thought, like, if we push subscription or unsubscribe uh, features, you know, we, we, we get our users to not hit the spam button, which would ding your reputation. Um, so it should be a win-win situation. But then, Heather, you had some thoughts on, you know, what, what, what the challenge there is. Yeah, thank you, Marcel, for teeing that up. I mean, we cannot deny it, even as senders, right, and marketers. You've got to give recipients a way to get rid of stuff they don't want to get anymore, and we support that. And you're doing that design in your subscription view, which I think has been um, delivered very well, frankly. Um, the challenge is, as you saw in our unsubscribe trends by ISP that Clea shared, um, and the engagement rates that I shared, you know, due to COVID, engagement may be up, but so are unsubscribes. So you can see when those that functionality rolled out, the Yahoo yellow line had two peaks. Now it did level out a little bit um, as we shared with you. So I think, you know, people need a way to get off the list. The challenge is as marketers, once they are out, we've lost them. We've lost our way to reach them, at least via email, right? So one of the things that I was thinking we have opportunity for in our collaboration in the future, not just us with you, Marcel, but as an industry and as a community um, and people to people, you know, what is there a way for ISPs to promote a sign up to a subscription view, right? Instead of unsubscription, it is subscription, um, but we don't see where as easily to sign up for things. But, you know, is there a way to authentically and organically that doesn't feel contrived or manufactured um, to, to allow consumers to sign up for things they really do want? That would be awesome. And that may be something that um, our brands and clients and the industry is looking for um, as a new acquisition channel. So I think this is just an area where there are opportunities for us to keep collaborating and we need to do it. Yeah, and I, I agree. I mean, I think this is a call really. I mean, hopefully there's also an in incentive for senders to send more relevant things, right? So receivers are less inclined to actually hit that unsubscribe button. Um, and also, you know, maybe invest a little bit more money and, you know, not just, not just print that flyer, but, you know, maybe adopt some of the shiny toys. So uh, our mutual customers actually uh, feel that they actually get some value out of these emails uh, and not just being overwhelmed. And but I agree. Like if you do that, and then maybe we can also present, you know, some other things users might be interested in, which are also, you know, sending awesome uh, emails and experience. Hopefully, you're also leveraging some of the shiny toys. Um, then I think that's a win-win situation, right? It's not just get rid of stuff they don't want, but as I said before, maybe we can show them other things they actually might want, and then the user can still decide. Um, how they want to interact and engage with that stuff. So I agree. And then, uh, you know, I just said, send more relevant emails and this, and this comes back to uh, the KPIs you guys talked about. Um, obviously to do this, you need to understand or senders and brands need to understand uh, the performance of an email campaign, right? How many people open it and use pixel tracking. And uh, as I said, I believe some senders are actually looking at the wrong things. They, they uh, interpret things in a way which might not be rooted in reality. We've seen this sometimes where they come out, come to us and say, you know, my sender score is in the 90s and uh, nobody's opening my email or uh, our open rates are down, um, our click rates are down, so what is happening? Um, and I mean, we look at what, what is actually happening, it's like, you know, your sender score is good, but all emails are in the spam folder because our users keep saying this is spam. Uh, or something similar like that. So what is your, I mean, you already talked about it a little bit, but what is your take there, Heather? Yeah, I appreciate this. I mean, I, in fairness, this is what our job is as, as deliverability strategists and experts is to translate for the customer and the brand often what is really going on. And we need to look at 
certain metrics to be able to see the trend and measure that success or failure. And it's it's often uh, one of us saying to a brand in, in the industry, well, look, you may think this corner of the world looks okay in the metrics that you're looking at, but when we expose this whole other arena of metrics, it's like, we have a serious reputation issue and it's not the ISP, it's you, right? So we have this tool that we need with the metrics and we need to be able to advise and educate our clients on what they should be looking at, what they shouldn't look at, what the full picture is. And so I think when when I ask, you know, what do you mean by the wrong thing? So in our conversation preparing for this presentation, we had some really engaging conversation because I said, now, what do you mean? Why can you say we look at the wrong things, right? But when I think about what Clea pointed out early in the presentation, not all clients are looking at unique open rate by ISP by day, maybe, or they don't have access to logs or they're only looking at seed results or sender score, right? So this therein lies the problem. It's our job as senders, whether you have a deliverability expert or not, to look at a wide swath of metrics so you have a full picture. And Marcel's telling us, I think, that we've got to become more innovative and evolve what we're willing to look at and survive on because the, the channels are changing and the devices that emails are being consumed on are different. And the open pixel may not always be available. So the things that I, you know, talk about earlier in this presentation as being so critical and reliable are changing. And we've got to open up as an industry, right? And think about different metrics and where to get them and how to use them. And that full picture is a collaboration opportunity for us to talk about. Yeah. And as, uh, the topic obviously leads us to you know the privacy conversation um so while i fully uh you know appreciate the fact that senders and brands need data um you know as, as, as clear said they need individualized data to actually create that um experience uh that personalized experience at the same time on our side uh we need to protect our users um, our users as i said expect us and some of the old habits as i said before um you know we have been a little bit naive and um, so i think we need to really collectively think about how can we protect our mutual customers really um, but how can we still use data in some ways or look at other ways of measuring things uh, to still deliver value to both sides uh, so obviously we, you know, we have data feeds available, which, uh, which are aggregated. So, uh, it's privacy conscious data sharing as we, we, we call it, but maybe there's some other things we can do together to really ensure the privacy of our mutual customers, but then, you know, maybe take it to the next level. But what are your thoughts, uh, Clea? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, it goes back to that, you know, keeping the communication lines open between the two of us. Um, I, you know, you've sort of alluded to the potential of tracking pixels going away at some point. Um, that gives senders a lot of pause because that's a really valuable as engagement um, metrics in terms of opens and clicks via those via those pixels. It's a really key metric in terms of customer churn in addition to complaints and unsubscribes. It allows us to see you know who is not interested in receiving these emails and therefore you know, we, we carefully craft these contact strategies around those metrics. Um, and without that visibility, it sort of muddies the water and creates this potential for more senders sending more mail in the blind, so to speak. So just having some sort of, you know, replacement, as you mentioned, the data feeds, but we would need it to be more broadly applicable, you know, across, across other ISPs as well. I think that just that open dialogue is key. Yeah, and then, and then I mentioned, you know, maybe we measure this elsewhere. Like, what is your, what is your experience there with when you talk to brands and your clients? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, as we talked about, there are obviously other KPIs we we should be keeping a close eye on. Um, in terms of replacing that that engagement, that pixel data, it's tricky because if you if you consider things like purchase behavior that's not necessarily a full picture or, or the purchases may, may not be hap happening on a frequent basis. If you're thinking about something like buying a car or booking a trip, something like that, um, you might not have the frequency of data again, to be able to say, this is what this customer is interested in and would like to receive. And sometimes you can't tie it back to the right email address, you know, or the one used to subscribe. So it can be difficult to, to tie the right data points again, when trying to build that customer view. Yeah, which which actually is a perfect example for AMP um, because you can create these semi-locked-in experiences with AMP, 
you know, when you actually have a customer who has an account elsewhere, they don't have to go to that other web page and you can't tie it all together. Like you can actually do this with AMP uh, because it's like, literally going to the service of your client, um, actually bypassing a um, whole bunch of things. So, but that's a, a topic for <laughs> a completely different session, I would say. But uh, again, it's just to me, it just means uh, that, like I said before, I think we have all these puzzle pieces. We just need to, a, talk about it really at the same table. Uh, we also need to understand why we're doing these things because at the end of the day, like both, you know, obviously like uh, you guys like have on CLIA and Oracle side, for senders in general and us, we are really serving the same customer. And we need maybe literally in some cases need to be in the same room to actually do this, just like these guys there. So that our consumers, our customers really have a, a great experience and then uh, we should be able to actually build these bridges and then maybe one day we'll just look just beautiful like that one uh, right there. Um, I don't think we're there yet. Uh, I think we're on the right track. We certainly need to, need to talk more. We need to collaborate more. So in an ideal world, uh, we would do that, uh, you know, maybe in the bar, literally. Um, and that's why, where I would say, you know, come find us and talk to us. But, uh, you know, in the absence of that, obviously, uh, right now, at least, ask questions here. We have some time left or find us on the Internet and in whatever tools you're using. Um, but let's build uh, those bridges, I would say, and let's create an awesome experience uh, for our users. And thank you for listening to our different perspective and different worldviews. Thanks for the presentation. It was really interesting listening to you. And yeah, the beer is really something that we miss at the CSA Summit, I guess, because now after those sessions, we will all meet together and having this beer in Cologne. But yeah, thanks for that picture, Marcel, Clea and Heather. Um, there have been a few questions raised. Um, and um, if you don't mind, I will read them out to you. So I think... I got the feeling Clea and Heather do have the better backup. So there are a few questions against the receivers here. Um, you were dis uh, discussing um, KPIs and um, on what KPIs you should look at and all that kind of stuff. There's the first question that came up about view time optimization. Um, is that a KPI where where it already did prove to bring, bring better AO, uh, ROI? Um, is that something that you recognized, Marcel? It's a helpful tool and uh, it is a sh this shiny new tool that may be helpful to optimize engagement? Uh, so here we are. I didn't want to talk about real-time optimization because this was a you know Verizon Media only tool. I didn't want to turn this into a sales session here. But very quick, A, you can find me and learn more about it. Um, uh, B, yes, it actually is one of those tools where we believe in uh, creating something which is more privacy conscious because senders don't have to track users, right? We don't have to share any data and we can achieve much better results in some cases where, uh, you know, similar to send time optimization, we can actually deliver an email right then and there when the user is actually engaged with the mailbox without sharing any data and uh, that actually drastically increased open rates as well as click rates. That's all I would say about that. The question wasn't raised by me, I promise. <laughs> um, again, again uh, about KPIs. From a receiver's perspective, you already said you sometimes have the feeling that senders are looking at the wrong things. What should be um, the KPIs a sender should pay attention to, especially if you were already discussing that at some day, the pixel-based tracking goes away, but what comes next? How to measure the success then? Uh, and I think I mean, we talked a little bit about that, right? We want to collaborate uh, in the industry to see how and if we can replace that. But at the same time, I would actually pass this question over to Heather and Clea because I mean, they're really in the business of helping clients and they have a better understanding of, uh, you know, in the absence of open, we're not, yeah. You know, in addition to open rates, here are things you actually should look at, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think 
in this case, it's really about the more data, the better, right? It's Heather, Heather alluded to look at a variety of data points, look at everything you possibly can. You know, when, when we're, for example, at Oracle looking for our customers, it's the platform data, it's the bounces, it's the complaint rates, it's the, you know, the click rates, the conversion rates, in addition to opens. It's um, also looking at ISP direct data, potentially those data feeds from Verizon Media, um, Gmail Postmaster tools, what have you, looking at if you have access to a deliverability monitoring tool for layering on some of that, you know, seed placement data or trap data, that's all interesting, but making sure that you have a complete picture of as much data as possible is really what we like to look at. Yeah, and I, you know, Clea hinted on this also during the presentation about the fact that um, the metrics that we use are pretty critical to, to building up those models that I was describing. So we would definitely, need to examine where we would be flying blind. So one of the things Clea said was, without that open pixel, we really would feel like we're operating in a blind manner because we've learned to rely on it so heavily. With that being said, there is a broader set of data that needs to be looked at as far as business conversion and how things are going further down the funnel. Um, so I think there are ways to adjust. I think the key is that, you know, what you do have access to now organize it well. So one of the other things we talked about is you may not have access to unique open rate by ISP type of thing, metrics, right? Or logs, or um, you need to look at as much data as you have access to. And one of the things that I would push back on the ISPs about is a really good Postmaster tool that like Google Postmaster tools or like um, Microsoft's SNDS, um, those are useful tools for senders to gauge where do I have an issue? and what am I doing to um, impact that? So that when we go back and adjust targeting, um, establish what to do to influence a reputation rebuild exercise with a sender, we're able to see whether or not we're having a positive impact or not. And those postmaster tools have been invaluable to us to be able to do that. So hats off to Google and Microsoft for providing those to senders for years now. Um, those, those types of things in collaboration are critical. Uh, for all senders to be able to look on the same playing ground. Where do we stand? Are we doing well or not? And are the changes that we're making influencing positive impact and result or not? Direct question to you, Marcel, that was raised here. Are there plans to block open pixels to lose that tracking uh, path? Are there plans at Verizon, for example? Uh, so, <laughs> I don't want to have a situation where, like, like Google, where they said in the past, no off, no entry, um, and then have that haunt me forever. Uh, but yes, we look at uh, how can we, like I said, how can we protect our users as they're expecting us to do? Let me see. Right. Okay. Um, Heather and Claire, you already talked about it during your uh, presentation that Due to the COVID-19 situation, um, not even the email marketers from an operational point of view, even the management level um, recognized the importance of the email channels. Did you see increase of consulting to make more use of those shiny tools, of that shiny stuff? So did you see that increasing and, and how did you manage that and what were typical questions and requests to you yeah one of the things that i want to share that has been that i've been observing is um the necessity you know any kind of necessity is the birthplace of true innovation and what i mean by that is it's crazy times right now and clients are willing to test anything um which is kind of cool like even the leadership as you point out um at brands are saying we gotta try it and so they're testing things like annotations and Bimmy, and they're much more receptive right now because at least these programs, the two that I just listed, are free of cost uh, other than some operational effort to get up and running. Why wouldn't they try it? If they see any lift, it's lift. So out of necessity with this economy and layoffs and furloughs and stores being impacted, Clea mentioned it's make or break for a lot of businesses this holiday season period. 
um, this could do them in. So getting it right and testing things that could give them any lift whatsoever is critical. So we're in a very interesting time that's transformative for brands, but also for the industry. There's also things to choose from right now. So the timing is right. And um, yeah, there has been definitely an increase I've found. We've been very busy with consulting and clients willing to test and try things. Clea, do you have anything yeah. to add? Yeah, I've definitely seen the same thing. And I think also you, you touched on briefly this point of there are more limited resources. So there's this weighing of, we need to squeeze everything we can out of email right now because it's all we have uh, in some cases. Um, but but also we have you know, the skeleton crew. So how do we, you know, what is the right priority? So there's a lot of, uh, again, us trying to speak to the value of these tools and help them prioritize in terms of ease of implementation and then, and then impact to their business. So we've definitely heard a lot about these, yeah. Cool. There's one Another thing I can ask senders to do, don't send more of the same. <laughs> Sending more should never be the solution. Agreed. Right, especially this year, right, in the US, uh, you know, the, as, as Leon Heather was saying, uh, the, the Black Friday might not happen the way it did in the past, and we also have an election. So it's not just, you know, brands trying to sell things, it's also other people trying to sell the president this year. So uh, mm -hmm. people are overwhelmed with email. That relates to another question that was raised here. Um, how long, from your perspective, Marcel, how long can a sender resend emails to non-openers or non-clickers? Um, because there is that, that, that fine line, they want to re-engage as many subscribers as possible, but no sender wants to 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 risk running into a block so from your perspective is there i don't know a guideline that you can share with us or that you would recommend no there's there are no absolute numbers um it's uh, you know if it comes it comes down to list hygiene you know standard best practices if you're sending to uh users who not who do not engage with your email whether this is open rates or clicks as you should probably measure um, if they do not do that, you know, after the second company, stop sending emails to them. Um, it might actually hurt your reputation if you keep sending to people who do not interact with the email. Right. So one of the one of the things that we've learned from our predictive analytics model is that if we limit resends to just those who are most likely to open or click moving forward from the model, we do much better. So when we shoot for higher deciles it actually does perform well and can end up helping us, but it's a very fine line to Marcel's point. And sending the same thing again with just a different subject line tends to be a challenge for recipients, obviously. So they feel a little bit switch and bait. Right, okay. Now I think we're nearly done. It's just one minute left. There's one important question left raised by a participant. Marcel, where can we buy that baseball cap? <laughs> I think the most important question of that session. <laughs> yeah. I got it when we launched uh, our new consumer focused uh, Yahoo Mail app last year. Um, I do believe actually this is in some Verizon store somewhere. Um, uh, I have to I have to find it out. I, I, I think that actually you can actually buy it as, uh, as a customer. Okay. At least in the US. Marcel, you've got to lean down and show everyone what it says so that in case there's any question about what the hat says. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Other than that, thank you very much to you three uh, to uh, present such a rich presentation and webinar to uh, the participant. Thank you very much for that valuable uh, um, content. Um, it has been a pleasure to uh, be that one hour together with you here. I would just like to call out the other following up webinars that we uh, try to put from the CSA Summit in Cologne into the digital world. You can still sign up for them um, and uh, yeah, get to know about more experience and shared knowledge from the market. Um, last but not least, thank you for joining and uh, stay healthy and uh, hope to see you all soon. Thanks everyone. Thank you very much. Bye guys.